going on people? Mike Z-Town here. We're doing a different kind of video today. We're up in this fancy uh, white people cabin out in Blairsville while the ladies are out doing some ridiculous fucking race. So we're sitting here in the cabin fucking chilling and decided to uh, do some questions. So I'm here with my friend Anthony who has his own YouTube channel. Why don't you tell him what your YouTube channel is all about? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I do a YouTube channel with some friends. It's called uh, Absolute Zero. It's uh, some pretty nerdy shit, mostly talking about Star Wars and I think so far just Star Wars. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much the extent of it. But lots of toy collecting, uh, reviews, different things, unboxings. Uh, it's worth checking out. How long have I known you so far? Oh, man. Um, since you were, what, 14? <laughs> I remember the day well. Why don't you tell them about it? It's a good story. <laughs> that is a good story. We actually met <coughs> kind of just in passing and didn't realize it until several years later. I don't live in Atlanta. I was living in South Florida. Came to Atlanta with some friends to go to a fest. And somehow or another we were with uh, some friends and Mike was there. And we were in the back of somebody's pickup truck. He was Crystal, yeah, Crystal's pickup truck. None of us really knew him, and he was just kind of sitting there quiet, didn't really say anything, and we were all just kind of wondering who the hell this kid was. <laughs> Is that what you were wondering? Well, you didn't really say much. I, I was probably scared, because all you guys looked crazy. But the best part of the story, <laughs> I'll, I'll let Mike tell that part. I mean, obviously, everybody in the car was either white or looked white. And they're all, like, shaved heads, tattoos, pretty big dudes, and then there's me, this little spot of color. And this car, this car pulls up, and he starts yelling out the window. <laughs> He's like, "Jump, jump and run, man! They gonna kill you, bro!" <laughs> but he was totally serious. Yeah, we were all just kind of confused. <laughs> I remember I was like, "What's this guy talking about?" <laughs> yeah, so that was our that was the first time I met Mike. <laughs> oh, We've been man. friends ever since. <laughs> all right, well, since uh, since I met Anthony through. Punk and hardcore. I uh, figured this question would be pretty appropriate. Uh, Jack Monster thirty two thirty one asks, "Who is the long one, Jack Monster?" Um, hey Mike, I was wondering since you've been into punk rock and various other forms of indie culture for some time now, how you've seen audiences discovering the underground change. I'm twenty two, so I don't remember what the underground was like during the nineties and early two thousands before the internet became ubiquitous. Has the influence of the internet over culture changed the contemporary indie audience? Obviously, audiences change over time to correspond with the development of society, but have the core values of individuality, art, weirdness, and unabashed self-expression been squeezed out by people who would rather play it safe and conform their personalities to accepted behaviors, appearances, and thinking? I do a lot of reading on the music scenes of the past because I have a large interest in various cultures, and I feel like in the past, punk indie underground culture was more elitist, defensive, and subversive. Today, terms such as hipster have been redefined to mean a music snob, but hipster elitism comes off as more trendy than, say, punk elitism, which came from feeling accepted in community of other freaks and weirdos after being rejected by conventional society. For that reason of finding a safe haven with people of mutual values and interests, I think there was more of an effort to filter out mainstream conventionalist elements that could ruin that. <laughs> Even the blinds were like, man, this fucking question is ridiculous. I think there was more of an effort to filter out mainstream conventionalist elements that could ruin that. Examples being Green Day popularizing pop punk, Jawbreaker signing to a major label, Nirvana popularizing alternative culture. Do you think that the ease of accessibility to indie culture has affected things for the worse since the internet? That people who participate in indie culture today would not have been a part of it 10 to 20 years ago? Has the weirdness, creativity, and individuality been compromised and tamed with this influx of ordinary people? Do you think there is a sub subculture taking shape to fill the subversive void left by the old underground scene? That's like kind of 15 questions yeah. wrapped up into one. but. Not yeah, a good monster. question. I, I think it's cool that somebody took the time to actually write that detailed of a question. Hey man, my fans are fucking real. Yeah. 
So going back to the first part of the question, kind of what was it? How people got into it, or how people yeah, discover how people discover it? Some of these. So I think I've seen that change quite a bit over the years. When I first got into punk and hardcore, it was uh, kind of the late '80s, 1987, 1988, and obviously then you know, I didn't have access to the internet and and different things like that. So it was it was kind of hard to find find some of these outlets. Fortunately, where I grew up at that time, we had a really good record shop in town, so I could go there and, and find uh, some albums and things like that that really kind of drew me in and piqued my curiosities. But even then, back in, in those days, it wasn't like today where there's the availability of those kind of records. They were really hard to find, you know, because it just wasn't as available like it is now where you can download it or just go to any store and find it. It was uh, it was pretty rare. I think I found out about a lot of things through through zines, reading, you know, shitty photocopy yeah. copies of zines that people put out, but that was the way of getting information out. That was the way of communicating in a in a small scene, you know, even worldwide, people were communicating through zines and and actually writing letters to people. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, in the in the early 90s, I did a zine and I would get letters, like actual letters in the mail from people all over the world asking questions and, and just giving me feedback, and that, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I wasn't into punk rock in the late 80s because I was still a kid because you're an old man. Um, but, was... you know, I got into punk rock in the, the early to mid 90s, and it's basically the same story. There were only a few people at my high school that knew anything about punk rock. You know, I'd be walking around with an Operation Ivy shirt and no one knew, no one knew what that was. I got most of my shit through, through zines as well. There really was no internet. I mean, the internet existed, but it wasn't widely used like it is now. The only, yeah. only thing I remember using the internet for was the Straight Edge List. I don't know if you ever used the Straight Edge List. I, I remember that from like the, from the, man, I guess mid nineties. Yeah. But yeah, in the late eighties, definitely. I. I I, I don't think there was much of anything on the internet. I remember in my high school, because I went to a pretty big high school, a couple thousand people in the city, and there was myself plus two other people maybe that, that were into the same kind of music and the same scene that, that I was into. And man, we were we were like the black sheep of the school. We were definitely the outcasts. And like, not just like, you know, the, the weird kids, but like the people that everybody wanted to beat up. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was, it kind of sucked at times. I remember that very well. I remember I was the only punk kid and the only vegan kid at my school. And they used to fucking uh, throw jello fruit cups at me. They'd knock my lunch out of my hand. Yeah. You know, they'd call me faggot every day. They'd punch me in the chest. The heart checks is what they used to call it. You know, I remember, you know, uh, you get a zine in the mail or whatever, and then there'd be, like, ads in there for other zines. You send them a dollar. Yep. And you literally, you'd put a, a one dollar bill in an envelope and mail it. And you know, you'd wrap it in in like notebook paper so the mailman wouldn't see it. And you know, every time I don't think I ever remember getting screwed over for this. Every time that zine would show up, and you'd find ads for all kinds of bands in there. And that's how that's how I discovered a lot of the bands that I found. That and like skate videos was how I found bands. And right. I, I think that kids don't really they have it so easy now that they don't really know what it means to have to actually really look. They think looking for a band is going online and just typing shit. I remember finding out about a lot of good bands through the Thrasher Skate Rock tapes. Oh that yeah, I remember those. Out. Yeah, found some awesome bands through those. Mm -hmm. I remember writing to bands that had ads. You know, send a dollar for for their demo. Yeah, and and I had no clue what this band even was. All I knew was they were a hardcore band. Yeah, right. but, you know, there was just so few hardcore bands, or at least that. That I knew of at the time, I was excited just to get a demo in the in the mail from some band I knew nothing of, and just to hear what they sounded like. And think about doing that now. Think about if a band said, "Send me three dollar bills in the mail, and we'll mail you a demo." Yeah. There's no fucking way you yeah. do that. There's no fucking <laughs> way. But back then, punk rock was so different that you didn't have to worry about getting fucked over. So he also had this question about the core values of uh, of punk rock changing. And, I mean, I definitely think the core values changed. And I think that they changed probably around the, the late 90s and, and early 2000s. I think that when I got into punk rock and hardcore, that it really meant something. Like, if you met, and this is going to sound fucked up, but if you met a hardcore kid that really had 
no opinion on the world, on any sort of politics or, or any sort of social inequalities, anything like that, then you thought it was weird. Maybe it was just isolated to the scene that I was in, but even like the crusty punks, like if you ever sat down and talked to them, like they really had solid views on what was going on. And a lot of them, even more so than like the sober straight edge kids, they really had these ideas of how to make change. But I can say in the past 10 years, I haven't met anyone like that. You know, I look at the scene today versus the scene back in those days when I first got involved. And I think, you know, the, I think what drew people to that scene has changed a little bit and it has a much larger, you know, following of, you know, the, these music types and these scenes and, and people are into it for a variety of reasons, which isn't bad. Yeah. But I think like back in the, in the 80s and, and early 90s, people that were into like punk and hardcore scenes were there because, you know, they, they were drawn to it for a specific reason. They were, you know, a lot of people that just maybe didn't fit in into other scenes. You know, um, I, I got, I, I fell into the the straight edge scene because I, I felt like I had a common bond. For the first time, I found people that I felt like I truly had something in common with. And uh, you know, it wasn't just a, a thing to do because I thought it was cool. These were people that kind of became my my second family. And uh, you know, that's who I spent all my time with. It's it's who I truly enjoyed being around. You know, whether it was politics, whether it was environmental issues, you know, veganism, everybody was kind of drawn together by very strong core set of beliefs. You know, I originally got into straight edge and hardcore and punk rock because there was really no other place for me. I had moved here from California and, you know, the black kids didn't want to talk to me, they thought I was weird. The white kids didn't want to talk to me, they thought I was weird. You know, and the only kids that would be my friends were like the weird, you know, Heshers at my school. You know, and then I found a couple other friends who put me on to stuff like No Effects and, you know, Op Ivy and stuff like that. And then I found Straight Edge after that and Hardcore. And like you said, it became a total second family. It was like, wow, I really have things in common, like strong things in common with all these people. And then you start discovering things. I never really knew what veganism or vegetarianism was, but I knew that... I liked animals. And then when someone explains to you, well, you know you're eating an animal and you probably should think about that. And then you do, and there's always that turning point of either you think about it and you just plain don't care, or you think about it and you're like, wow, that's really fucked up what I'm doing and I need to change. And when you find like this core group of people and that you all have this central mentality of how things should be, it's really, really powerful when you're young. But now i just i don't see that like punk has become so commodified that i don't think that there are any central core values to punk rock anymore